We must do what the gods did in the beginning. This the gods did, this men do. This Indian adage summarizes all the theory underlying rituals in all countries. This is how the legendary scholar of religion, Mircea Eliade, summarizes one of his deepest insights in his book, The Myth of the Eternal Return. That insight not only came to be central to Eliade's work, but remains highly influential on the field of religious studies to this day. In this video, we will take a closer look at what Eliade believed was the most powerful religious impulse of primitive man, the impulse to becoming universal. To understand our ancestors, Eliade tells us, we must understand the way they saw reality was vastly different from how we see it today. In archaic times, man saw the world as an intersection of two planes of existence, the sacred and the profane. The plane of the sacred was the plane of forms, to use Plato's terms, or of archetypes and categories, to use Eliade's. The sacred contained gods, ideals, universals, things that exist beyond time and space. The sacred was the place of permanence, immortality and power, the wellspring of life, the creative ground of being. The plane of the profane contained, well, it contained everything else, everything mundane, trivial, impermanent, undefined, banal. All the random accidents of daily experience, everything that doesn't fall into a category, that doesn't follow an ideal. There was nothing universal about the profane. It existed concretely, in time and space. It had a beginning and an end. Since it was the place of change, the profane was also the plane of decay, of death. Notice how modern thinking is flipped on its head when we examine archaic ontology. Everything you can see, touch, smell, everything that has a material existence in space and time, everything we would today call real, was, for archaic man, unreal. Or rather, it was only real insofar as it expressed a transcendent ideal, an archetype in the plane of the sacred. It was the archetype, the universal, that appeared real to archaic man, while the particularities of space and time seemed like pale reflections of ultimate reality. Of course, all of this is Eliade's own terminology. He himself reminds us primitive man never used such terms and philosophical concepts. Nonetheless, Eliade tells us, primitive man acted out these beliefs, even if he did so unconsciously. Anyway, the point is, archaic man always strove to be as close to the sacred as possible, for it was the sacred that was real for him. Eliade writes, an object or an act becomes real only insofar as it imitates or repeats an archetype. Thus, reality is acquired solely through repetition or participation. Everything which lacks an exemplary model is meaningless. It lacks reality. Neither the objects of the external world, nor human acts, properly speaking, have any intrinsic value for archaic man. Objects or acts acquire a value, and in so doing become real, because they participate in a reality that transcends them. Among countless stones, one stone becomes sacred, and hence instantly becomes saturated with being. The object appears as the receptacle of an exterior force that differentiates it from its milieu and gives it meaning and value. It appears incompressible, invulnerable. It is that which man is not. Eliade sees all actions of archaic man as motivated by the same impulse, escaping the profane and concrete and entering the sacred and universal. In Ernest Becker's terms, this translates as escaping death and entering into immortality. We can see then how the biological instinct for survival evolved into a psychological drive to remain in reality, in the realm of the sacred. But how did our cake man enter the plane of the sacred? Well, his technique for achieving this was, in Eliade's terms, repetition, imitation and participation. In simple words, since the plane of the sacred contained all life, meaning and reality, primitive man modeled every aspect of his life after sacred archetypes. For example, marriage was performed as a repetition of the cosmic union of opposites. Conflict was perceived as an echo of the war of the gods. Building and crafting were an imitation of cosmic creation. Eliade gives us the following example of the art of building in ancient India. In India, before a single stone is laid, the astrologer 
shows what spot in the foundation is exactly above the head of the snake that supports the world. The mason fashions a little wooden peg from the wood of the Kadira tree and with a coconut drives the peg into the ground at this particular spot in such a way as to peg the head of the snake securely down. The act of foundation repeats the cosmogonic act for to secure the snake's head to drive the peg into it is to imitate the primordial gesture of Sama or of Indra when the latter smote the serpent in his lair when his thunderbolt cut off its head the serpent here symbolizes chaos, which Indra conquers and converts into order. This, of course, is the sacred meaning of laying the foundations for a new building, as the ancient Indians well understood. It is through this technique of repetition or imitation that the concrete, otherwise profane action becomes universal and thus sacred. By identifying with a myth or an archetype, man participates in ultimate reality and enters the plane of the gods, of life everlasting. This leads us to a fascinating conclusion. Whereas our modern culture's highest goal is to become an outstanding individual, to put a dent in the universe, as Steve Jobs put it. In archaic times, the ideal was just the reverse. Eliade writes, The man of a traditional culture sees himself as real only to the extent that he ceases to be himself, imitating and repeating the gestures of another. In other words, he sees himself as real, as truly himself, only and precisely, insofar as he ceases to be so. This conclusion might seem less bizarre to those familiar with Eastern wisdom traditions, like Buddhism or Taoism. There, the individual self is regularly depicted as an obstacle on the spiritual path, though for altogether different reasons. Here, Eliade is giving us an alternative reading of this well-known motif. To transcend the small self in the archaic imagination is to transcend the particular, the profane and enter the universal, the sacred. It is to escape the transitory reality of your individual life, full of random and meaningless particularities, and to connect with the universal patterns of human life. For archaic man, these patterns were best captured by myths and legends. Thus, he strove to participate in these universal patterns through aligning his own life to them as closely as he can manage. Eliade hints that there might in fact be some timeless wisdom in the archaic way of thinking. Wisdom we may bring into our own lives even today. He asks us to reflect on the following. What is personal in the emotion we feel when we listen to the music of Bach? In the attention necessary for the solution of a mathematical problem? In the concentrated lucidity presupposed by the examination of any philosophical question? What Eliade is getting at here is the following. Whenever we are deeply immersed in experience, whenever we enter what modern science calls a flow state, all sense of space and time disappears and just the present moment remains. Every notion of a distance between you as a subject and the experience as an object is also gone. What remains is the experience itself, outside of space and time. That is to say, infinite and eternal, sacred. This modernist take on archaic thinking might point to some deep truth about life. Perhaps, psychologically speaking, there really is some universal, platonic plane of reality hidden beneath ordinary experience. A plane of reality our ancestors knew how to enter, but one we have lost our way to today. Here we just scratch the surface of Mircea Eliade's classic. Check back on us next week for more on the myth of the eternal return, as we continue to mine the book's deep insights about man's place in the universe. Make sure to like and subscribe too if you'd like to see this channel grow with more content on religion, psychology and philosophy. And remember Rumi's words, what you seek is seeking you. See you next time.